Hello, everybody. I'm going to give everybody a second to file in. Hello, and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 634th New Social Environment. I'm Raven, the Programs Associate here at The Rail, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation featuring Nick Cave and Matthew Biro. We're thrilled to welcome poet Anthony Almendares here to close today's program. Before we get started, the Brooklyn Rail acknowledges Black Lives Matter and that here in New York, we are on Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lone Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. We recognize land acknowledgements are not a replacement for actual necessary decolonial work, but a reminder of place, of the legacies of dispossession and enslavement that have sustained and enriched the stolen land that we are speaking from. And now to introduce today's guests and hosts, Artist, educator, and foremost, a messenger, Nick Cave works between the visual and performing arts through a wide range of mediums, including sculpture, installation, video, sound, and performance. Cave is well known for his sound suits, sculpture forms based on the scale of his body, initially created in a direct response to the police beating of Rodney King in 1991. Rail editor at large, Matthew Biro, is a professor in the Department of History of Art at the University of Michigan. He is the author of Robert Heineken and the Art of Appropriation, published this year, as well as many other publications. His review of contemporary art, film, photography, film and photography have appeared in art form, are in America and others. And now to pass it over to you, Matthew. Thank you so much. And thank you so much, Nick, for taking the time to discuss your new exhibition on view at the Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago um, from May 14th to October 22nd. Um, as I think most people who are watching know, the show will then travel to New York. Well, it will be on view at the Guggenheim Museum from November 18th um, till April 10th, 2023. Um, so just to jump into it, uh, probably your best known works are your sound suits, which you've been making uh, since 1992. Could you talk a bit about the sound suits? What were the issues that motivated their creation and how have they evolved in your practice? Hey, Matthew, how's it going? Hi, everyone. Uh, <clears throat> you know, the sound suit um, originated from the Rodney King incident in 92. That was really the catalyst that sort of shifted my practice. Prior to that, it was really sort of large construction sort of paintings of, of sorts. Um, but it was really that sort of moment where <clears throat> for the first time we were able to see and witness this sort of recording of this heinous uh, beating and that was so profound in my uh, existence that it woke up my consciousness, which I thought was awake, but that incident changed my life in such a drastic way. And uh, it led to the first sound suit that was constructed all out of twigs. Uh, and just sort of me sort of at that moment taking sort of that opportunity to sort of uh, do a sort of a response to uh, a moment that was really sort of devastating and troubling for me as a, 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 a man of color. So you've you've described them as protective, as shielding the person who wears them from um, showing their gender, their their race, their class. Um, they're also very assertive. They're very um, beautiful. They are proud. They find kind of um, beauty in. Um, in combination with, you know, very horrible origins. Um, can you talk a little bit how, about how they've, they've kind of evolved? I know you've been making them for a long time. I think in the show we see works uh, roughly from um, probably about 
209 or 211. You've been doing them um, a lot longer than that. When we approach them in the show, they're sculptural. Um, however, um, you've worn them and you've also used them as catalysts for a lot of performances and events. Can you talk about how that evolved out of the, uh, the sound suit practice? Uh, yeah, you know, the sound suit, I think, you know, the first one that was constructed, you know, I was building a sculpture actually, and did not even realize that I could actually put this object on the body. And the moment that I put it on the body and started to move in it, it made sound. And so that was really how the origin of sound suit came about. Uh, that sound made me sort of realize that in order to be heard, you got to speak louder. So it was really this sort of form of protest, uh, color, pattern, this sort of uh, extreme sort of adornment really is my sort of rebellious sort of uh, <clears throat> sort of side that's coming through. It's really what I have used as my sort of form of protection, my sort of way of resistance is through the sort of form of beauty. Um, and, you know, I'm interested in the sound suit as a sculptural object, as well as this sort of performative uh, sort of, uh, object as well. You know, when I go to the Museum of Natural History and when I look at these sort of artifacts that really sort of have been pulled out of one's uh, <clears throat> culture and modified for us to look at as these sort of relics, these sort of objects, and to sort of understand that they really serve a greater sort of purpose and need within a particular sort of culture. So I was interested in this sort of double sort of reading that, you know, how does it read as a static sort of form? And how does that force the viewer to sort of uh, stand uh, and be confronted with this uh, sort of uh, high sort of uh, powered sort of figure? Um, and so it was that that I was interested in, as well as the movement that it can sort of be, that can be applied to, to the form. I mean, a lot of the ones we're seeing here are fairly rigid and confining in certain ways. You also developed a much softer, more movable sound suits. When did they come about and in, in, in what context? I'm thinking well, of works like what's in um, blots and, you know, mostly when we see a performance, those suits that people are wearing. Well, I think, you know, when it comes to performance, I have to sort of, sort of rethink about um, construction. I have to rethink about the sort of stress that is placed within these sort of objects. And so that means then materials have to also be sort of reconsidered. Um, and what is the proper sort of uh, source material? What is the sort of uh, proper sort of infrastructure that needs to be put in place in order for these to be brought to the body and to sustain a, a very sort of high level of, of, of movement? So it's really a different uh, sort of material choice in source, uh, more or less materials that uh, that appear to, to have more of a softer sort of uh, flexibility uh, from anywhere from raffia to hair uh, uh, to uh, uh, chain mail and things of this sort that allows the body to sort of create, expand with the volume of, of, of these sort of materials, as opposed to the static ones, I can sort of then sort of bring sort of ceramics and other sort of materials that allows it to stand as a sculptural form. And so those all came about, the performances came about when I was interested in this sort of expansion, sort of 
uh, working in the sort of performance sort of space arena where it was really about um, <clears throat> collaboration. It was really about bringing it out into the world uh, and having a different type of engagement. Can you maybe talk a little bit more about some of those um, collaborations? Uh, I remember in Detroit, uh, following your work when you put on your show at the Cranbrook Art Museum, um, you would um, have suits brought to Detroit um, there'd be uh, a lot of work with musicians, choreographers, um, uh, performers for, for, for months beforehand, um, kind of getting ready. Could you elaborate a little bit about how that process unfolds? You know, when it's, uh, the thing that's interesting and important to me is that, you know, I could bring uh, a, a full on performance to a city. But what's more interesting for me is that when I bring the work to the, to a city, but then hire the community to build the project. And so, you know, I'm interested in being in residence in a city and for, two, it could be anywhere from a week to two, three weeks and really sort of seeking out, getting my uh, feet on the ground and, finding out who lives here and, and, and building this entire infrastructure by work with musicians, dancer, vocalists, uh, poets, and really building this uh, project on site. Uh, that has always been the sort of directive that I've always sort of uh, approached performance and sort of community sort of outreach. And then I'm also, depending on how we're working and what's in the surrounding, I may be working with uh, social um, organizations within a city that uh, I fold into the project. Um, but, you know, we're sort of seeking and scouting out talent in vast, ways. Um, and then we start to then go into building um, a project. And the amazing thing is that, you know, what the audience sees is the conclusion of, of that work, but the real sort of magnificent sort of part of that, that uh, work is really the uh, the residence part of it is is sort of working and building the work and seeing how it sort of is taking shape uh, and really sort of creating these sort of uh, uh, spaces of possibility for local sort of uh, artists to sort of imagine themselves working at this sort of vast scale. And so, you know, the testimonies are incredible. Uh, that we sort of experience along the way. Uh, so, you know, it's my way of introducing a city back to itself. Uh, you know, we tend to, you know, work, you know, we tend to all work in isolation in silos and we forget that there's a larger community out there and how do we sort of find sort of ways and keep ourselves open to these types of, of extraordinary sort of collaborations that do, that are available. I mean, to me, that's one of the really, one of the many amazing things about your art, whereas your art is very distinctive when we see it in a museum, is very, very much Nick Cave um, artworks, and yet you manage to create a situation which expands and incorporates uh, so many other people, almost like you're a band leader or a musician in some way, where you give moments of to other people to kind of solo within um, a broader context. And I think that is just um, one of the reasons that make you such, such an important um, artist today. 
Could you talk a little bit, uh, you know, well, you collect a lot of objects for your art. I know you you mentioned at some point that, you know, one sound suit, um, all the patterning kind of emerged out of after finding um, a, a particular doily or something like that. And, you know, then the rest of the pattern kind of forms. So could you talk a little bit about um, the objects that you collect from thrift shops, flea markets, estate sales and the like? Um, this we're seeing in in works like what we just have up right now in the background or maybe in the wall relief um, on the left where you are um, finding objects and then bringing them into an ensemble. So could you talk a little bit about that process and what you're looking for in the works that you collect in order to make uh, some of your sculptures? Yeah, you know, when I think about like even the first sounds, it was all out of twigs that were that were collected in in the park uh you know so that was really you know that was a, a moment where you know this idea of collecting in excess and surplus uh started but it really goes way back to when i was a teenager and you know i come up from a family of seven boys brothers all one year apart and just these sort of hand-me-downs and you know the moment that i had to, to receive my brother's clothes i was thinking like well this is not gonna work for me and the whole idea of deconstructing and rebuilding and sort of trying to find your own within that sort of object was really the sort of beginning of me sort of looking at something and sort of shifting the sort of narrative in 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 that moment. But then it was, you know, and so that has led to, you know, my sort of material source is really outside of the studio. It's really in the flea markets, it's in the antique malls, it's really sort of about history, the nostalgicness of collecting and finding these sort of amazing sort of artifacts and, and uh, uh, sort of the discarded and reclaiming and asking myself what role do they play moving forward within a particular work, the hierarchy of all of that. And so, you know, I've always been interested in, um, you know, this sort of excess and, and consuming that and sort of, again, reintroducing it in a in a very, very different way um, in, in a new way. Uh, and so, you know, I'm, you know, I will jump on a plane and fly to Washington State and rent a cargo van and shop all the way back to Chicago. That's how I sort of go about resourcing. And then on the way in that process, I am building, you know, I'm at the point where I can sort of be scouting and I can find one object and then that may be, that may have a pulse that sort of is, is of interest to me and building work in, works in the moment. So that's really kind of where I'm at now is that I'm finding that I am building works in the moment, looking for things that I need and being able to put it together. Uh, to a degree in that moment. So, you know, this whole idea of collecting, resourcing, and, and consumption is, again, very much about uh, really sort of gathering everything that is needed in order to build a sculptural form. Some of those objects that you select uh, have very painful histories. They're very violent. They've been used to denigrate um, Black people, construct an ideology of white supremacy. Um, at this, and you incorporate them into your work. Uh, and at the same time, your works are very beautiful. How do you wreck a work in that tension? Or how do you try and deal with that tension of explo exposing very painful aspects of United States history and at the same time uh, leaving room for beauty, for hope, 
for um, transcendence, perhaps, of that situation? Well, I think that's just it. I think it's that, you know, how do you, you know, I choose to shift the narrative. You know, I've, I've, I've always chosen to shift the narrative. And I think that comes from, um, you know, being raised and, 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 you know, my mother at one point had to set us down us young black men down and really sort of uh, talk to us about racism and uh, bringing awareness to that we could at some point be confronted with that, but not that that was an obstacle. And that is the difference. It has never been uh, an obstacle. It's always been an awareness that I had to sort of uh, recognize that c could and does exist. And I have uh, been confronted with that. But how do I sort of find ways to uh, move myself forward to work again uh, against the pushback of that uh, and in realizing the importance of, of who I am as an individual, uh, uh, understand my power, uh, living within that, um, and really sort of, again, sort of shifting that narrative. You know, some of these objects are very offensive, uh, very uh, degrading. But again, uh, I sort of tend to sort of think about that, but I'm also thinking about uh, ways in which uh, this is unacceptable and yet I am going to reimagine what this, may look like. And so therefore that opens this sort of narrative, this opens the conversation uh, for us to be had uh, within the sort of complex and um, uh, difficult uh, subjects. Well, I think that's one of the things that makes this exhibition so powerful is really that ability to open that conversation and that ability to kind of, you know, extend in that conversation out into the world and bring people in into the museum who may not um, uh, expect to see themselves there or feel um, pushed out um, from it in, in for 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 one reason or another. So that tension between kind of the the painfulness, the violence of the imagery, uh, some of it, and then that affirmation of um, somehow we're going to get to a better place despite this history is, is, is very um, inspiring. We've seen a lot of images now. And one of the other things that's just amazing about this uh, ex uh, ex ex exhibition is your approach to installation. I mean, typically when I'm looking at a Nick Cave work in a museum setting, I'm noticing this incredible craftsmanship, this incredible detail on, on the sound suits or another um, sculptural ensemble, ensemble. And then I am somehow being led through um, through the floor, through stuff in or to through through um, wall painting or you know beadwork or other things um, into the background. And there's something there's a, there's an incredible way you um, um, integrate things. So, you know, uh, I love how you encourage the movement through the space by tying the works together or integrating them into the um, surroundings in some ways. Everything's in, in, in conversation. How do you think about that? So how did you, for example, begin to design the, the MCA show? And what were you looking for? Sometimes bringing works from very different moments together into a, an installation that's where the works speak to one another. Well, you know, I think with this particular show, you know, what I sort of 
first uh, uh, understood was really sort of uh, understanding just space, understanding the sort of playground uh, that I would be sort of uh, operating on. Um, and what does that mean? What does the space, the architecture of, uh, what does that look like? What is the fourth floor? The things such as like, you know, you have the entire fourth floor. Well, that, what does that mean? Just the idea that you have the fourth floor. And then for me to think about, uh, I think about that first, I think about that, you know, this is in my, on my home territory, you know, this is for my community, this is for my city. So I'm thinking about that. Then I'm thinking about just sort of flow. Just how do I want the experience to be for the viewer? What is that open sort of invitation, that welcome, welcoming moment? And what is the, the closing sort of moment? Uh, so I'm thinking about like choreography, I'm thinking about movement, I'm thinking about uh, arrangement, I'm thinking about the order of thing. You know, we came up with this sort of interesting sort of, um, phrase that sort of really sort of created a structure for the show and that was what it was what it is and what it shall be and so it really created these sort of three sort of periods of 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 the work that sort of really helped solidify uh an understanding of how we were going to look at the sort of inventory and the history of the inventory and sort of select works based on the sort of three criterias. Um, and so that also helps sort of bring uh, to bring an understanding of, of the sort of structure of the show. But it was really me thinking about all of those things and really thinking about the feeling, the overall sort of emotional sort of feeling of the sort of necessity of, of compassion, empathy, of inclusion. Um, and sort of all of this sort of is all sort of in harmony of one another in order for this show to perform in the way in which I intended it to perform. Because it, you know, I have to sort of walk away and this show has to be able to do the job that it is that I have uh, set forth for it to do. And so that also is very important is that, you know, I, it has to be able to do the job in which it is uh, uh, set to do. You, the, the show begins with um, your large scale installation, A Spinner Forest, um, which uh, I saw, I think, originally at Mass Mocha, uh, a much uh, an even bigger version. It sets this tone of kind of wonderland, playground, this beautiful uh, space in which we are walking into. And then we get a little you know, with the, the 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 constant movement, the rainbow like colors, and then we get a little bit closer and we see guns and bullets and teardrops. And we also become uh, in, in the images and we also become very aware of the fragility of the spinners and the fact that you know you've left us paths to walk through but if we go off the path that would be dangerous because we could hurt the art um what were you thinking about by well, by beginning with with spinner forest what what kind of mood did you want to um set with that you know i opened the show with uh, with a spinner forest and that was um uh... I really wanted to, to sort of start off with this this sort of sensation, this sort of this emotional sort of 
sensation, this sort of awe, this sort of like uh, kinetic kind of sort of sensory. I wanted to open you up with emotion and feeling. Um, but then, as you said, as you get closer, you you find that you are then sort of hit sort of in the gut with, you know, this sort of uh, jarring sort of guns, bullets, because at the end of the day, you know, that's what we're dealing with right now. We're dealing with just so much gun violence in the streets, in the neighborhoods, and yet we are struggling with that, yet we have to continue to live and, and get on with our lives. And, you know, it is in our backyards. And that was the choice of that wind spinner. You know, we, you know, we see that in our backyard. We see it as, as something that enhances and that sort of glorifies the garden and brings beauty and light. And uh, you know what? It's, it's in our backyards, this, this crisis that we're, we are existing in right now. And so that was really sort of what that moment was about and how do we navigate that? So in just to change the the question a little bit um, to um, a little bit outside the show, although I hope we're going to uh, circle back. Um, in 2020, you started Facility, a multidisciplinary creative space, which is home to your studio, as well as Faust Associates and the Sound Suit Shop. And it also um, serves as a creative hub for other artists, artisans, designers, and architects. Could you talk a little bit about Facility? and um, some of the projects that you've you've already done there? Well, you know, facility, uh, you know, I was look, had been looking for a building for about seven years. Um, and it was really sort of looking for a live work uh, situation, of course. Uh, and really sort of also I was interested in sort of a, a frontal sort of facade that could allow a sort of visual sort of uh, expression to be sort of shared within the community. And so I happened to sort of find this amazing building that looks like from the outside three mom and pop stores but on the, and so I wanted something very humble, let's just say, but on the inside, it was wide open. And the facade uh, uh, was all completely closed in. And so I opened it up and created these sort of 16 foot high uh, by, I would say 30 foot wide windows which are three sort of separate gallery spaces um, that we program uh, from, you know, established artists to up and coming artists. Uh, you know, when we were in COVID uh, and, you know, all the schools had to go online, my graduate students did not have a thesis. And so I provided the facility as a uh, space for them to sort of have their thesis. And so it was uh, for about a year, each student had the storefronts for one for one month. And so facility is this sort of uh, space, this place that houses, you know, Nick Cave Studio, Bob Faust Design Studio, Jack Cave Studio. And it's really a sort of a working space but then it also facilitates other projects, uh, working with other artists through invitations. Uh, but it provides this sort of viewing capsule for the community outside. You know, it's not a gallery that's open, but it allows you to sort of have 
this sort of access of, of being able to sort of see within the space and then behind the, the wall is where uh, the studio sort of takes place. So it's a, it's a project space that uh, constantly is in flux and evolving and, and uh, responding to things that are sort of currently going on, may it be projects that we do ourselves as well as uh, through invitation. So um, tomorrow you're opening a new show with your um, brother, um, Nick and Jack Cave, The Color Is Fashion Exhibition at the Du Sable Black History Museum and Education Center. Um, could you you also had a, uh, a kind of a preview of that in a um, fashion event that you put together uh, about two months ago. Could you talk a little bit about, I mean, you have obviously your, you have a long standing history um, in, in designing fashion that's very important to you. Could you talk a little bit about this new show and, and what, what it comes out of and what it means to you? Well, you know, I think for other more, uh, the exhibition at the UMCA Museum of Contemporary Art here in Chicago, um, uh, when I was asked to do that exhibition, I also was interested in uh, a collaboration of sorts. And I wanted it to be with DuSabo, Black History Museum and Education Center. Uh, so therefore it's, a, you know, the MCA is on the north side, DuSabo's on the south side. So I wanted to do, uh, create this sort of call and response, these two sort of exhibitions that would book in one another. Uh, and so the MCA was very much in support of that. Uh, so it was the exhibition, then there was a call and response through a fashion performance uh, about the exhibition. So I invited my brother, Jack, who also is a um, lecturer here at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and um, uh, to create an 80 look collection uh, that was in response to the exhibition. Therefore, we uh, uh, brought on 80 performers that wore the collection, uh, that we then created a fashion performance at DuSable's Roundhouse. Uh, and then that performance piece was then uh, led to this exhibition at DuSable in the Roundhouse, uh, The Color Is. And so again, sort of uh, creating a, an opportunity for the community at large to sort of have this sort of amazing insight on, again, sort of looking at fashion from the perspective of a sort of an exhibition uh, for other more. Uh, and I was also interested in sort of creating that uh, because it's, it's interesting that how, uh, you know, when I sort of look at my work and look at who responds to the work, you know, the work is written about in, in the design world in the fashion world. Fashion designers are inspired by uh, an exhibition or a body of work. And so I wanted to sort of imagine myself sort of responding to my show. And so this exhibition runs um, from, uh, uh, oh God, when does this, it opens Friday here. Uh, uh, the 26th, and then that uh, the colorist runs until November 27th. And so, you know, again, allowing it to be accessible to the community, uh, you know, we, we worked with sort of amazing, 80 amazing sort of individuals to build the project, uh, worked with Jamila Woods, who's a vocalist here, 
uh, around the performance and also LaBelle. Um, and so it really was, again, another uh, amazing sort of public sort of uh, project that led now to this exhibition uh, that then will then follow up with a documentary of building the color is which uh, will premiere at the MCA in September. I mean, I think that's very characteristic of your work and very powerful that often the museum shows create a dialogue with um, other places in the city that you want to highlight in different ways. So um, DuSable in this case, um, in Chicago, I remember, um, again, when you were uh, working at Cranbrook in 2015, um, creating performances at the Ruth Ellis Center um, for um, um, LGBTQ youth. Um, so always kind of setting up a dialogue and um, continuities or, or movement between the institution, the museum, the fine art institution, and the um, either other institutions or um, the world at large. And that's very characteristic of your practice, which is just amazing how multidimensional it is. You're a visual artist working in a broad range of media, from sculpture to painting, to installation, to performance, to video, to social practice and community building. But you're also um, a dancer, having studied with uh, Alvin Ailey, a fashion designer, and a professor of fashion um, at the uh, School of the Art Institute um, uh, of Chicago. Um, how do you balance all these different roles? How, a, how do you find the time for it? But B, you know, do how, how do they feed off each other? Do they influence each other? Do they do you try and keep them separate? Well, you know, I think that uh, yes, they all certainly influence uh, one another. But I think it's really sort of um, you know coming up as a young. A uh, young creative person, I can't even say as a young artist, I'm just, you know, as a creative person, you know, I was sort of inspired and influenced by, you know, the concerts that I would go to George Clinton when I think about it, when I think about like uh, Avon Ailey and, and sort of my first experience of seeing them perform, you know, I think about looking at Soul Train and just, you know, through dance, through dress. Uh, and, you know, I look at, you know, the church ladies uh, and sort of understanding the power of dress then. And so, and, and also having family where, you know, it was more sort of inspired as opposed to sort of, you know, a hindrance, uh, you know, being able, you know, my mother did not sort of tamper with uh, what I was interested in. You know, she allowed that to sort of flourish however it needed to. And uh, whether or not she understood it from the beginning and was concerned about like, oh my God, this kid is going into art. What does that mean? What does that look like? She allowed it to, happen. And so when you're not sort of hindered and you are given sort of space to be as you see yourself, uh, that changes the game that allows you to imagine, to dream. Um, and so, you know, every aspect of all of our practices, they're sort of rely on some form of collaboration. I don't care if you're working in administrative aspect of it, there is a collaboration. It takes a community to build an exhibition it, uh, to work within the public sort of realm. Uh, and so I sort of have always been interested in that, you know, as a young artist at the 
Kansas City Art Institute, you know, I was doing happenings in the streets, you know, pulling together my, you know, my cohorts, my friends, and we would then parade down on the plaza, you know, that was my canvas was the, com the community outside of the institution. And, and what does that mean? What does that look like? Uh, what am I creating? Um, and it's all just a big sketch pad. You know, it's all just ideas and, and, and to, to be able to live those out uh, and to sort of try to bring an understanding of what this all means and how this may sort of, uh, influence your work moving forward, um, you know, it's, it's yet to be sort of seen. Uh, so, you know, there is, you know, the end is not over till it's over. And so, and in the meantime, there's a lot yet to do. I'm in, interested in a lot of things. I'm interested in life. I'm interested in sort of being as much a part of that. Um, and also, in, you know, again, inclusion, bringing as many people in to be part of a bigger sort of cause. Um, we see a lot of um, kind of old fashioned loudspeakers in the work in the show. They look like old gramophone um, horns. Uh, and you've used them, well, we're seeing it in, in the wall relief right here. Here. We also see them uh, sometimes um, in the sound suits. We also see it in the um, bronze work that you've been doing uh, more recently. Obviously, as with one of the sound suit pieces, um, speak uh, louder. Uh, it's about protest. It's about giving voice. Uh, they often also evoke kind of hearing aids or sensors for me that you're also taking things in. And I was very struck that uh, Speak Louder, uh, that um, piece was put with one of your tondos, which I remember from, I think it was Whether or Not at Jack Shaman. Could you talk a little bit, um, if there's a, do you find, do you have the install shot, Raven, by any chance? It's like probably uh, earlier or later, it's the same piece, but um, yeah. yeah, perfect. Um, um, these um, these tondos that you've also been doing, which you have connected to things like Doppler radar radar patterns and brain scans. So it seems that you're pulling in constantly from the outside, you're responding to the outside, you're improvising with the materials of the world, but then bringing it in and honing it in a way to create a coherent message, to create a, uh, a strong statement about what's going on um, at the moment. So could you talk a little bit more about the tondos and how you view them? I also note that you have connected, again, installed one with the Trayvon Martin piece that's also yeah. in the show. You know, uh this this is the other sort of amazing thing about putting this exhibition together is that there are opportunities where I can sort of partner uh, works that uh, have always been seen separately uh, and in this case been able to merge and put them together. You know, here the uh, gramophones. Sometimes there are morning. There for me, they're viewed as morning glories. Uh, when you look at the garden plots, uh, you know, they're sort of built within a floral sort of setting. And here they are sort of silenced. But, you know, again, there is sound, there is this sort of need to communicate, there is this sort of amplifying this need to sort of get the word out, uh, a need to sort of protest. I don't care if it's silent or not. There's ways in which we can communicate without verbal communication. Uh, in the tondo that you see behind, you know, it, it's, you know, the original sort of idea comes from these extreme weather sort of patterns and the rhythm that's within that sort of uh, 
uh, sort of uh, con construct and then looking at extreme, uh, looking at brain scans of inner city youth that live in uh, gun zone communities and just looking at this, the trauma of that and sort of colliding those two forces together. Uh, and so again, it talks about a global uh, uh, sort of, uh, a global phenomenon, a global sort of, of reality. Uh, and then, you know, Speak Louder being this one sort of uniformed sort of uh, object that moves collectively together as one, as one would be looking at a uh, procession in, uh, at a New Orleans sort of funeral sort of uh, procession. So it's really sort of tying all of these sort of elements together and talking about a global sort of uh, pandemic uh, of sorts. Could we go to the Trayvon Martin piece? Is that possible, Raven? It's, um, yeah, a lot, no, you, you were yeah. going in the right direction. There Number it is. Four. Yeah, four, exactly. Um, so again, you made that in uh, 2015, I believe. Yeah. Um, what's What's amazing about that is again, this this to me, you know, this you don't know what it is. It changes um, depending on where you are. It seems very sculptural from far away. You go closer. You see the amalgam of of objects. The um, the basketball sneaker, the blown um, plastic molds, the netting that kind of um, pulls the object together that both um, protects it in a certain way, but also um, kind of evokes the, the, the violence of Black people being trapped, being netted. Um, could you talk about uh, making that work and what you were trying to do with it? Well, I think with all of, you know, there are these, in the show, there are these sort of moments as you move through, there are these sort of pivotal sort of moments uh, where time uh, is sort of identified. I mean, you know, this particular work is a particular time uh, in history that again, triggered and altered my studio sort of practice. Um, and so uh, I'm not sure what's going to alter my train of thought uh, as I'm trying to sort of move myself forward. But you know, what is, ha and what is happening now is that, uh, you know, I was pretty much uh, driven by the sort of um, the sort of injustice, the sort of gun violence, the sort of police sort of brutality, the sort of uh, targeting of of uh, black bodies. Uh, and that has always been sort of the sort of catalyst that has driven the work. And so, but what I have come to understand now is that I'm interested in other aspects of my practice and that when something occurs, that's when I will sort of implement that within that sort of body of work or where I am currently within my sort of practice and ideas. And so, you know, it's, and so setting up this show, I've learned a lot about uh, just this idea of trigger, you know, what triggers uh, uh, the moment, you know. And so for to me to do this piece, TM13, you know, it was Trayvon Martin that's what triggered this piece into existence. And to be able to put it again with this tondo, which again sort of uh, uh, creates this sort of global sort of uh, world. Uh, it speaks about uh, this, the trauma and, and the sort of uh, 
inhumane that exists globally in the world. One of the directions you seem to be going in right now is the new um, bronze work, like amalgam. Um, could you talk about how, what you're trying to kind of develop there? Um, you're going to a more uh, traditional uh, form of art making, something that connects it to, you know, a very long-standing tradition in Western art, permanence, um, kind of the power of, you know, these huge um, cast figures. Ra Raven, if you can find that seated figure with like the branches coming out. Um, yeah. Um, so yeah. that, we're, we're Where's that that work going? Well, you know, this closes the exhibition at the MCA. And, and this is, you know, I've been trying, you know, to get to this point for quite some time. Uh, you know, as you move through the work, there are small bronze works. Uh, and so that I've sort of been sort of incorporating bronze and found objects, but it all has been a process to get to this point. And this is what I considered a petite bronze. Uh, but I'm trying to get to where this work lives out in the world, outside of the walls of the institutions and becomes accessible to all. And so, Again, this is really way before the sort of the history of uh, bringing down these Confederate sort of uh, sculptures that are uh, that are in the world. Uh, you know, this work was way before that. But you know, I'm I'm just you know I think I think a lot about. Uh, the community at large and and you know we still have a large part of of the world that doesn't frequent museums and so how do you know i think i'm thinking more about civic responsibility how do i get the work into the world in a different way and so this is the beginning of that process starting to sort of take take shape and take form. But I'm interested in this sort of uh, formal, this sort of, uh, this, uh, perm the idea of something, the permanency of, 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 of this work uh, and where does it live and who has access to it. Uh, and just really thinking about legacy in, in a sense. And I think that leads to like, you know, the MTA project in New York at Times Square, you know, this sort of amazing public uh, piece that is all out of uh, mosaic, ceramic. Uh, and, you know, it's a public piece that is permanent. And so I'm, you know, that is part of what I'm leaving, what I'm working toward to leave behind is this sort of the permanency of, of, of the work. Thank you. Um, I have, of course, tons more questions, but uh, the audience has been very patient and I would really love to, um, you know, let Nick respond to all the questions that you may have for them, for him. Okay, our first question is from Michelle, and I'm going to ask it on her behalf. Um, her question is, um, Nick, can you address uh, your fabrication or your making techniques socially and aesthetically? who and how the collaborators take part and contribute to the final works and who goes into making one sound suit, for example? Ooh, that's a big question. And sorry, <laughs> you're hearing my doggy bam, bam, barking, but um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, the studio, it's, you know, I pretty much have a 
full-time staff of eight assistants at any given time, but creating this uh, for other more exhibition at the MCA, you know, the studio went up to 30 assistants. Uh, and so that's the other thing about facility that it, we have enough space to fluctuate from, you know, the eight to 30 if needed. Um, but I work with fabricators outside of the studio as well um, that are all local, uh, you know, to working with bronze is true form production who I work with on a lot of, uh, of the work, the bronze work. Uh, I work with uh, Manifold who also creates a lot of the metal sort of armatures. Um, but, you know, in the studio, I work with assistants that really come from a making background. Uh, it's not that we really have time to train you how to, to do it. It's really sort of, you come in for a, a, a week of testing. Uh, and so we sort of, uh, you know, you go through that process and then uh, you're brought on. But, you know, it's really, you know, technical. It's really sort of coming in with the technical sort of skills uh, already in place. And, and um, you know, I work in a stress-free environment. I am not interested in overtime. I'm interested in really sort of like really creating a very sort of solid, very clear studio sort of practice behavior. Uh, they all are artists in their own rights. They go off and do shows and things of that sort. I get it. I understand it, you know, and it's important that they also are, uh, have uh, uh, the means to be able to do that. And so it's really a very sort of nice studio that's full of light. The energy is really great um, and we all work well together um, and we work really in advance I know two years out what's coming up so you know we have a calendar that we sort of me and my studio manager we look at weekly and we sort of talk about you know things that are coming down the pipeline and again coming up with strategies and, and uh, uh, really thinking about uh, the studio as it uh, moves forward with projects. Okay. Um, our next question is from GE, um, our friend GE, and um, <laughs> you should be able to unmute. Um, but, um, Thank you so very much, Raven and Matthew, and of course, Nick. Um, my question is, could you talk a bit about how sitting in silence in perhaps minimal spaces, perhaps even shedding attachments and getting closer to bare essences of self and, of course, all of our others awakens you to your creating? Yeah, you know, I, you know, I have been, you know, I think artists for the most part, you know, I have been sitting in silence for decades. You know, uh, before I had studio assistants, I was, you know, doing all of this solo. And, you know, when you sit in silence, you come very clear to truth. And so you really find yourself working through it, working things out. Um, and, you know, I just imagine if we lived in a world where we all, had to sit in silence one hour a day, what a different world we would be living in. Uh, so I think it's important to, you know, it takes a lot for us to just, a lot of work for us to just to be. And how do you give yourself that sort of time to understand your sort of being? And so, you know, I sort of recommend that you that we all do that uh, in order just to get clear. Absolutely. So thank you so very much for reminding us of that. Thank you. Thanks, GE and Nick for that question. Um, our next question um, will be from Chloe. 
Hi, Nick. Thank you so much for today. <laughs> um, I, I have a question for you about, you've spoken about the impact of making this exhibition for your hometown of Chicago. Um, and I'm wondering how you're looking ahead to the show in its next iteration at the Guggenheim and how it might shift or change there. Well, it definitely changes uh, because of, you know, a, 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 a different space. The architecture is very different. And, you know, again, I, it's interesting because as we were sort of installing the show, I'm in meetings with the Guggenheim at the same time. So I'm like, oh my God, you know, you got to turn off this hat, put on that one. And so, but then I think the most important thing is being able to go to the, the other space mm. and to be able to understand, uh, you know, it's sort of the structure, the architecture of, of that space and how that is going to uh, shift understanding the works that are going versus the works that are not going. Uh, uh, the sort of flow, again, it's all about the flow of the show, the experience. And so, um, you know, I, it's critical that I visit any space first, just for myself, for my body to introduce itself to it, for me to sort of receive it. And then to sort of just give myself time to sort of think about it. You know, no decisions are made right at the front end. It's really sort of me sort of like, uh, you know, understanding what I'm about to in, in, uh, endeavor. And so, you know, I remain very, very wide open. And I just start, again, just start to sort of think about what does this mean? And at the end of the day, it's really for the community. And, and so the show has to serve mm. in, in some capacity. And so that sort of is sort of the sort of fundamental foundation. And then how do we make that do that? Thank you so much. And I also very quickly wanted to ask you about the exhibition's title, For Other More, which is very hopeful, but also contains within it an acknowledgement uh, that things need to change. And so I was hoping if you could speak a bit about to naming the exhibition. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's really sort of acknowledge those that are forgotten. You know, it, it's really, you know, when I think about this sort of survey and I walk through it and thank God I can do that many times in Chicago. You know, I think that, wow, this is what I committed myself to for three and a half decades. Uh, and so, but then at the same time, it's for others. It's, you know, it's inclusive. It's, it's you know, it's, it's never for me. It's always been for everyone else. And so that's also sort of an important sort of moment. Uh, you know, how do we sort of create these invitations and how do we open that up and, 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 uh, and create this sort of offering of sorts? Amazing, thank you so much for those answers. Sure. Okay. Thank you guys. Um, at The Rail, we have a tradition of ending our community events with a poetry reading. And today I'm thrilled to welcome our poet of the day, Anthony Alm Almendares to the stage. An artist and composer working with sound and improv improvisation, performance, video, and writing. Anthony Almendares' work, Almendares's work challenges the hierarchy between video and audio stimuli undermining their respective stereotypes in relation to how we interpret and inter internalize our surroundings. Stage is yours, Anthony. Thank you. Uh, hopefully you can hear me. And I'll just go ahead and start reading. Student, musician, composer, filmmaker, salesman, assembly worker, park caretaker, administrative coordinator, trumpeter, teacher, mentor, artist. I grew up in South Central LA in tightly knit apartments, neighbors on both sides, and six cousins crammed into a studio. 
the first generation of children born in the United States from a long line of campesinos, of field workers, workers, great grandma, great grandpa, grandma, grandpa, mom, dad, to list a few, most of whom never finished school. I was passionate about music, movies, and television, the worlds they offered the imagination, Hanna-Barbera, Disney, Looney Tunes. Drawn in by the simplicity, the animation, the humor, and the music, televisions, films, and pop cultures, these provided an escape for me, for many people from the daily routine. It wasn't until years later that I began to be conscious of the racial undertone, deeply embedded, wrapped up in humor, in the imagery, narratives, the music, and sounds used to make them more palatable. I think of the nuanced, layered, and complex realities and how one constructs identity, the influence of mass media and the effects of its misrep misrepresentation and erasure, the distinctions between official narratives, marginalized histories, and subjective memories. While I may not have the privilege or the luxury to trace my ancestry further back than two generations, I have learned and unlearned much. How the body serves as an archive, how our histories, cultural traditions, and personal experiences are kept and transmitted. Generally speaking, as a society, we've been conditioned to view and consume passively. And I feel that this goes further with an immigrant community because there's a fear of retaliation. There is assimilation, acculturation, acquiescence. I believe that the social and the political go hand in hand. It's impossible to ignore or separate the two because our body is political because social constructs and categorizations are imposed onto our existence, affecting our livelihood. So how does one navigate this world? What does it mean to be represented? My past experiences have illustrated a clear separation between my life as a musician and my everyday life, one of class and economic status, alienation. Where is the representation of Central America, of the Caribbean diaspora? of black bodies, brown bodies, indigenous bodies, female and femme bodies, queer and trans bodies, able and disabled bodies, poor and working class bodies. Why do we keep playing the same music that's been heard time and again? Why do we continue to uphold the same composers when new ones emerge every day? These institutions were not made for us. Classical and orchestral music was not made for us. They are relics of a time past, music reclaimed for patriarchal society. One or class distinction and privilege role. So how do I exist? Improvisation is at the fore of my work where the possibilities are unbound, free and limitless. Listening to each other, playing, the ideas coming across dissonant, falling in and out of sync, but always in dialogue. Not for the entertainment, but as a way to resist, preserve and educate. Immaterial forms that we embody, transmitting through improvisation experimenting with new materials, field recordings, trumpet, electronics, sound materials, listening to everything, no matter what or when, attentively at work, school, making connections, associations, discovering the most intriguing sounds, mowers and their overtones, the rhythm of engines and their false start, leaf blowers, weed eaters, tires on gravel, the drilling of constructions, the telephone in an office, the hum of machines, the cooing for a baby, all of it evidence of labor, audible to the ear, though invisible. For at its expense, we have been able to progress. What would the world be like in the absence of labor? Would nature reclaim itself? Time and time again, we see a person who looks like us reach a position of power simply to replicate or produce the same or similar models of exclusion and exploitation. It's for that reason that I'm conscious of the space that I hold the place where I operate in academia, within the art world, with institutions that are politically and ethically under a capitalist framework, where the term practice, whether conscious or not, illustrates available time. Eight hours work, eight hours recreation, eight hours sleep. The first time that I heard the eight hour work slogan was during a history class in high school. Our teacher chuckling to himself amended the first part stating that it should be read as eight hours of school. It was a shock, the precision, the way in which time was measured. How did we arrive here? Human acting as machines, repeating an endless cycle of work and consumption, easily replaced and broken. Because in my experience, school was never just eight hours. 
my parents never worked eight hours. I never worked eight hours, and most people don't work eight hours. Work hard, play hard, time is money, another day, another dollar. Pull yourself up by the bootstraps. Work hard and you can do anything. Success is no accident. Over the years, I've heard many inspirational quotes and mantras, platitudes. I think about labor and the dehumanization of the working class, where humans act as machines, tools for commodities in exchange for capital. The human capital stock, as former White House economic advisor Kevin has stated near the start of the 2020 COVID-19 pandemic. I think about the language used, implications made, transparency afforded, the highlighting of class structures and the hierarchy of our society. I cannot ignore the dialectical relationship between labor and the ongoing class struggle. To break apart and describe labor as skilled versus unskilled ignores the nature of the work and that it is still labor. Labor is a condition of the human experience and an eternal necessity between man and nature and human life itself. We all labor and accept labor even in abstract form that creates the commodities used in our system of capital, commodities that are used to determine value in this world, yet who determines that value and how does that value mediate the world and society that we live in? The notion that our judgment and taste is the result of innate individualistic choices is built on a lie. It fails to recognize, as Pierre Bordeaux writes, that tastes are socially conditioned and reflect the symbolic hierarchy that is determined and maintained by the socially dominant in order to enforce the distinctions from other classes of society. It's a system that doesn't benefit everyone and where the degrees of injustice and social inequality have only grown over time, where products are valued more than people, and where the fruit of labor is stolen by a small percentage of the population. For our every juncture in our life, we are subject to extraction under constant surveillance and carrying the burden of a system that was never determined by the working class but instead happens to them and encompasses them. Is work truly autonomous when your survival is based on it? When the dignity of work and conditions, guarantees of steady employment, rights to grievances, intensity of labor are not afforded. If the pandemic has taught me anything, it's that without the working class, the system and this government would collapse. We are taught rugged individualism, but there is no equity. So how do we move forward? How do we survive in a society that grows increasingly violent? How do we reclaim ownership of our bodies, of our own labor, and the fruit of our labor? How do we recalibrate society to view the creation, performance, transmission, and preservation of culture as labor and as having value? How do we redefine productivity to include the immaterial material labor of black bodies, brown bodies, indigenous bodies, female and femme bodies, queer and trans bodies, able and disabled bodies, poor and working class bodies? How do we decenter whiteness and continue reimagining new visualities, intermediaries? and alternative potential futures. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. That was amazing. And thank you, Nick and Matthew. We'd also like to thank the MCA in Chicago for helping us with images and preparations in advance of today's event. Uh, special thanks to the Terra Foundation for sponsoring our NSC program and making these daily conversations possible and for the support of our growing archive. You can view today's event in our full archive on the Rails YouTube channel. Over the past 22 years, the Rail has brought together art, music, dance, film, theater, literature, and thoughtful social and political meditations in our monthly publication and, and in our public events, like here in our daily NSC. Please check the chat for a link to donate to support our writers, editors, and operations here at the Rail. And if you're free Monday, join us at 1 p.m. for a conversation with Catherine Bradford, Fong Bui, and Chris Martin on Bradford's exhibition, Flying Woman, now on view at Port Berlin, at the Berlin Museum of Art. We conclude with the poetry reading by Sasha McEvoy. You can turn your microphones on and say goodbye as you leave. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. That was super exciting. Thank you. Bye. Thank, Thank you so you, much. Nick. Thank, Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Matthew. <laughs>